Heavenly Father, I pray that you would bless my words. Mine do not matter. That is why I am wearing black. Black represents my sinfulness, but your words do. So Lord, I pray that you would speak through this sinful person. As this white is over my voice box, I pray that your word would be spoken through me to anyone that is hearing this that needs to hear your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome, friends. Thank you so much for being here. I have something that has been impressed on my heart that I feel like I need to share with you. There is a dedication to the faith. There is a fullness of believing in what Jesus has done for you, for the forgiveness of your sins, that we need to cling to so strongly that we can be a public witness to other people. And that public witness may not be somebody saying, either keep your faith or lose your life, it might be as simple as, this person doesn't know Jesus. Do I share this with them? The greatest news, the greatest thing that's ever happened to me and feel a little bit uncomfortable, or do I not allow them to have that gift? Or maybe it's somebody that does know who Jesus is, but you get to be the witness in their life by how you act. You get to be Christ's ambassador, his representative. And I'm not just saying this to you, I'm speaking this to myself. I need to be Christ's representative, especially when it's hard and we're going through the life of somebody who's who's struggling immensely, literally to the point of death, not just shedding blood, but to death. He confessed Christ and was Christ's ambassador. So we are looking at him because he is an example of how to profess Christ in the midst of crisis and struggle. And because his death points us to Christ, there are parallels in the story. It is incredibly exciting. He is one of the first Christians, and he may have been the first martyrdom. He was born in around 70 AD, and he died about 150, 160 AD. What that means is Jesus died, you know, around 30, 35 AD. And so, I mean, he really lived and died He was born within about 30 years of when Jesus died. That's a really close time gap. I mean, if you got to talk to somebody that talked to Jesus, that would be incredible. This is that guy. So Jesus had 12 disciples, right? And a lot of us, we might hear Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but for those of us that could use a little refresher, when we say Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these are four of his friends, four of his followers, four of his disciples that recorded his life and looked and said, well, we're gonna use different camera angles. We're gonna look and we're gonna say, this is what it looks like from different perspectives. And they recorded the three years they spent with Jesus and all of the miraculous things that Jesus did for them so that you could hear about it. And so this, John was one of those four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If you have not read them, please go and read them. They are incredibly short and the most important thing that you could possibly read. That's one of the first things I recommend. And if you haven't read it lately, go back and check it out. But (laughs) the last one, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John, one of his disciples, a direct disciple of John, so somebody that talked to the guy who studied under Jesus, that's who this is. So this is Polycarp. Polycarp was about 86 years old and he lived in Smyrna, which is like modern day Turkey. And the letter that I'll be reading from and we'll be studying together is an eyewitness account of what happened during Polycarp's death. So this is some pretty cool and kind of heavy stuff. Now, we don't necessarily encourage voluntary martyrdom, uh, just as they were saying in the letter. So something to note there. There are a lot of parallels between Polycarp's death and Christ, so if you can, try to listen for what those are. So three days before Polycarp was arrested and killed, he had this vision, right? He was laying down and his pillow suddenly, in the vision, burst into flames. And so Polycarp sits up, he looks at the disciples, his followers around him, and he says, I will be burnt alive kind of crazy. When he was praying to God, he just got this vision of what was going on for his future. And some of his disciples ended up betraying him because what was going on in the Roman government at this point, they were in charge and they were saying to worship Caesar. They were saying to worship somebody that was not Jesus. And Polycarp could not do that. He would not do that. And 
so when the Roman guards get there, there's some interesting stuff that goes on. There's a parallel between Polycarp's arrest and Jesus's. It's on a Friday. It's in an upper room that they found him up on the second story. And Polycarp comes downstairs. And here's the kicker and the part of the application we'll come back to later. How do you think he responded when he heard, hey, the guards are here. They're not coming to have anything less than an execution. He could have run. He could have fought. He decided to serve. He says, God's will be done. He comes downstairs and he gives the guards food and drink. And the guards are kind of thrown back like, oh, like we were coming to arrest this guy. He's an older guy. He's like 86. He's really nice. Like we came in to kill him, but he fed us. Huh. And so he asks them, could I please have an hour to pray? And they agree. He goes back and he prays and he's so engulfed in this conversation he's having with God that it takes him two hours. He just couldn't stop praying. How cool would that be to have a prayer life like that where even before death, I mean, you could go do anything. You could request, hey, you know, let's go here. Let's go do this. Let's go do that. Let's go have something fun. Let's go spend time with so-and-so. He said, no, 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 I'm going to spend time with God and I'm going to be such fellowship with him that I, I just, one hour isn't enough. I need two hours. When's the last time we prayed for an hour and we're like, yeah, gee, that's just not enough time. I guess I need another hour. And this is the last moments he's spending on earth. Like he's, he's talking with God and he hangs up the phone and he's going to see God face to face. Like it blows my mind that that is what he chose to spend his last time doing. So he gets arrested and he goes to this arena before the proconsul and the proconsul says, have respect for your old age, swear by the fortune of Caesar, repent and say down with the atheists. And so Polycarp, he grimly looks around at the wicked heathen, the people that were not Christians around him and gesturing towards them, he says, down with the atheists. Now it's not necessarily towards the people and condemning them, but he is pointing out that there is only one God. There is not this everybody's God, you know, like I know there's this religion and that religion and they believe in multiple gods and they believe in the Old Testament God and they believe in some other prophet that came later. He's going, no, 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 down with all of those religions. Like it is just Jesus. He is the only way. I'm the way, the truth, and the life and no one gets to me except through the Father. Check out John 14, 6. I mean, that's, he's very clear that Jesus is the only way to the Father. And why is that? Why is it that only Jesus saves us? Only Jesus gets us to heaven. I want to be very clear about this because this is crucially important to the Christian faith. If Jesus was a way and not the way, imagine how foolish it would have been for God to sacrifice his son if he did not need to. If you could just be a good enough person or be reincarnated enough times or be enlightened, why would you sacrifice your one and only son like God the Father did for Jesus? You wouldn't do that unless there was no other way. Jesus is the only way to the Father. So he says, down with the atheists, down with these other religions. And then the proconsul pushes him further and he says, now reproach Christ, denounce him, say that you don't know him, do what Peter did, right? Say, I don't know who this guy is and I will set you free. And here's a kicker, here's a highlight, underline this. 86 years I have served him, Polycarp declared, and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king in my savior? He's been faithful to me all along. How can I blaspheme him? And they say, well, we'll burn you if you don't. You will die for your faith. Do you realize that? And Polycarp responds, you threaten me with fire which burns for an hour and then is extinguished. But you know nothing of the fire of the coming judgment and the external punishment reserved for the ungodly. It gets pretty bold. Why are you waiting? Bring on whatever you want. And maybe it was this bold, like, bring it on. But I feel like he's just like, God, you guys aren't getting it. Like this life in like our bodies, like we care so much about our health and what we eat and what we wear and all this. 
He's like, you're not getting it. Even if I were to die and be burned for an hour, that is nothing because eternity is so much longer. And I know where I'm going. I know that I'm going to be in fellowship, in this bond, in this close connection with Jesus forever. The one who loved me so much, he gave up his life for me. That didn't, Jesus didn't just die for me. He died instead of me. I belonged on that cross. He took my burden. He took my shame. He took my guilt and my pain. How could I possibly deny him? There's a reality so much greater than just the here and now. There's a here and after. And when we focus on that, that's when you get the strength for the right now. Bring on whatever you want. And this miracle happened. It was kind of crazy. Um, and as they're tying him up, hands behind his back to be burnt at the stake, he starts praying, right? When, when you're being persecuted, when you're going through a difficult time, what's our response so often? We escape, we fight. Instead, he prays. And we learn three things from his prayer. First, knowledge of God is revealed through Jesus. He says, O Lord God Almighty, the Father of your beloved and blessed Son, Jesus Christ, by whom we have received the knowledge of you. We have received the knowledge of you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Second, we are body and soul, not just souls. We're not Gnostics. It's hidden knowledge. He says, now that I'm going to die, I'll be sharing in the cup of Christ and the resurrection of eternal life, both of body and soul through the immortality of the Holy Spirit. And third, he confesses the Trinity, that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and yet still one God. He says, I bless and glorify you along with the everlasting Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, to you, Heavenly Father, with him, Jesus Christ, through the Holy Ghost, be glory both now and forever. Amen. So he's literally in the flames and he's praying. And it says that we who were privileged to witness saw a great miracle. The fire shaped itself into the form of an arch, like the sail of a ship when filled with the wind and formed a circle around the body of the martyr. Inside of it, it looked not like flesh that is burnt, but like bread that is baked or gold and silver glowing in a furnace. And we smelt a sweet scent like frankincense or some such precious spices. So there's literally, there's like this glowing orb, maybe not glowing, but there's this orb, there's this protection, this circle around Polycarp that protects him from the flame. And at least from the research I've done on this, it seems pretty credible. This is probably the miracle that happened. And I did this little sketch. I mean, this took 15 minutes, so it's nothing, nothing too crazy. But it's this idea that basically Polycarp, apologize, the focus isn't working super well, but Polycarp was saved from being burnt to death. And yet he was still killed after this. They said, oh man, the fire isn't working. And so they ran him through with a dagger and he lost his life. And we'll get into some applications in a second because it's kind of crazy when you think about him looking like this golden baking bread, you might be thinking like, wow, yeah, as Jesus was dying, it might have been kind of like the sacrifice of communion as he was getting his body ready for us, the presence for you today. And you're like, oh, what's the gold about? Well, maybe, and this is just a thought, uh, maybe it's the most precious thing, more precious than silver and gold, having that faith and that confession in Christ all the way to the point of death. And that idea of frankincense and mirth, I mean, you see the spices um, both from the wise men at the beginning of Jesus' life when he's born into Bethlehem and his death in Jerusalem at Golgotha, right, the place of the skull and he's buried. So there's a lot of parallels pointing to Jesus. And after he died, what's interesting is his disciples, Polycarps, right, who again is the direct disciple of John who's studying under Jesus, wanted to take possession of his body. They wanted to just bury their teacher in a polite way. Well, the Romans wouldn't allow it because they said they might turn from worshiping the crucified one to start worshiping this one, Polycarp. So they were worried that if they gave Polycarp's disciples his body, they would start worshiping the body and stop worshiping Jesus 
not because they were worried about them stopping worshiping Jesus, but because now they would have a new crucified body to be worried about that's drawing attention away from the state, but now it's to a body. And I love this. They did not realize that it is impossible for us to abandon Christ who suffered for the salvation of the world, who suffered for you, or to worship any other. So here's the application, guys. I, I want you to hear something that I wrote down in the sermon I was listening to earlier today. It's Ash Wednesday. That's why I got this little smudge on my forehead. It's kind of going away now. Uh, for dust we are, to dust we shall return. I mean, we're going to lose our lives at some point anyways. Um, so why don't we live for Christ? We were going through Matthew chapter 6, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' longest message, and about verses 19 and 20. And the pastor said, treasure the things in your heart, basically not of this world. Don't treasure your reputation or your clothing or anything that you can get from anyone else. But treasure that he who knew no sin became sin so that you might become the righteousness of God. And treasure that the cross was full of a dead Jesus taking your place and that now his tomb is empty so that you can also have an empty grave. Guys, when, when we realize how much Jesus has done for us, how hopelessly we lost we were, how we were dead in our transgressions, it's not like, oh yeah, like we weren't a good person. Like, no, we were literally dead in our transgressions before Christ came. And when you realize how hopelessly lost you were before Jesus came and gave everything for you, we start to value what he did for us. And we would never deny him at that point. When you think of somebody that did something incredible for you, the last thing you would ever want to do is say, no, I don't even know that person that gave me the greatest gift I've ever been given. So guys, in application to this, my question for you and for myself is are we so grateful for the gift that was given to us that we are willing to go through some persecution, maybe not to the point of death, but I mean, if somebody's done that, we can do it too. But if you're talking to somebody and they don't know Jesus, maybe it's a family member, that's kind of hard. But you love them enough that you want them to have eternal life. You want them to have the greatest news they could ever receive. So maybe sharing that with them. Or maybe it's a stranger that you met. Just yesterday, I got a chance to witness to somebody in a mall at a kiosk. They didn't know who Jesus was and it's like, well, why wouldn't I share that with them? If I have a medicine to remedy their death, it would be malpractice for me not to share that with them. So guys, I'm asking, do we believe this strongly enough that we can witness to them? And I would also ask that for people that already know Jesus, all right, if you look at I believe it's Matthew 24, Matthew 25, when they talk about the sheep and the goats, and Jesus is saying, whatever you have done or not done for someone, you've done or not done for me, when you have been kind to someone, kind to the needy, kind to those who have no food or orphans or those in prison, you've been kind and loving to me. So we get to be the witnesses of Christ in this world, his ambassadors, his representatives, even to people that know him. And the most difficult one, right? People that don't know him, people that do know him, people that know you and don't like you. That's tough. When you have someone that you're like, how can I be Christ-like to you? I don't wanna be anything but that to you. I just wanna be worldly. And you know, you're stooping down here, I'm gonna stoop down here. But if, instead of being this thermometer that says, oh, you're here, I'm gonna match that. We can be a thermostat, we can just choose. This is gonna be the level that I'm at. Even if you're down here, Christ was way up here so I can strive to be like him and show you who he was because Jesus was the guy who, while he was 
dying on the cross, he said, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Can't we do the same thing? Like Polycarp, when he was being arrested, what did he do? Yes, he prayed for two hours and he was close to God, but what did he do horizontally with other people? He could have escaped. He could have fought. He served. Man, how good of a witness would we have when we have somebody that's persecuting us, even to the point of death, and we serve them. We make sure their needs are met. We give them food. Because what was their response? Why are we arresting this man? Such a venerable, such an honest and upright man who's full of this Christian love of God. And when we're so full of who Jesus is in us, we cannot help but speak that from our mouths. Check out Luke 6.45. What the heart is full of, the mouth can't help but speak. So if it's full of evil, full of ourselves, it's not going to work. But fill yourself up with God and you can easily do even the most difficult things. God bless you, my friend. Also, quick note, um, part of the reason that I'm wearing this today is because I was asking myself, well, should I not wear this as I go into a grocery store? I was like, ah, I don't know if I'd be a great witness. And then I thought to myself, well, why don't I pray and rely on God to be a good witness so I can be his ambassador? Yes, it's a scary situation for me to be in. I'm just starting to go into my ministry. but. If I can be a good representative for Christ, and even if it's something uncomfortable for me, if I can go do that, maybe I give a positive interaction and that helps somebody think about who God is and why some guy wearing this is kind to them. Maybe it would get them to think more about who Jesus is. So getting outside of our comfort zone to show who God is. The other part is this uh, format. Um, I'm a lot more of a perfectionist and like wanting to get things like nitty gritty perfect, like not the unfocused sketch that you saw and I like to add animations and all the above. Um, being a full-time graduate student, it's difficult to edit all the videos that I'm doing, so I appreciate your grace and some of the wind that you hear. Um, I, I've got dozens of videos from Israel, Lord willing, I get to go back to Israel this year and I'm going to have even more to go through. Um, I've got an interview with Dr. Daniel Pavla with my grandfather, um, who's also named John, um, and a bunch of videos from Europe, just a lot of devotional content. So again, if you're not subscribed, um, I would encourage you to, because it's not so much seeking God as God is coming to you. It's not about what we do for him. So when we are subscribed, not to just my channel, but to Christian media, to having the verse of the day pop up, it's how God comes to you, not how you go to him. It's kind of an encouraging thing when we follow Christian media. That's something I've been trying to do more. There's a lot of entertaining things to follow these days, but getting the opportunity like we have to access Christian media, again, anybody's Christian media that is a faithful follower of Christ, man, it is so cool and encouraging to see those things pop up. All right, I'm going to go for real. God bless you, my friend.